So Finn, Finn sent me an email and said, come and do a presentation on South African labor markets, uh, which for somebody like me is quite daunting because it means condensing uh, lots of academic work into a storyline that hangs together in 20 minutes and then also perhaps to pick out some common themes. Um, so I've sailed fairly close to the wind in terms of uh, Finn's request, but uh, I'm hoping that we can see some common stories, at least uh, for those of you from uh, developing countries and in particular middle income countries. So what I'll try and do is give you uh, firstly just to position South Africa, for those of you who are not aware of uh, anything about the country, then using the entry point of growth path dynamics. Because I think if you look at the dynamics of South Africa's growth path, at least since the end of apartheid, we get a strong sense of um, the nature of the labor market challenges, which then is the next section. And then I'll go on to just concentrating on three areas of um, what I think explains the poor labor market performance in, in the South African economy. So we have an employment uh, population size, I think approximately the same as South Korea. We're an upper middle income country. Uh, let me find my pointer here. Um, you've got a current account uh, deficit, which in fact explains much of our short term cyclical movements and in fact our growth path dependence uh, and something I'll come back to quite a common theme in South Africa is a very low share as a percentage of GDP in terms of manufacturing. And then this uh, outlier statistic is the Gini coefficient. So essentially, a middle income country with high levels of income inequality and a fairly undynamic manufacturing sector. I find these pictures incredibly useful to explain in, in sort of one visual the nature of an economy's growth path. So this is a growth incidence curve. Um, for those of you, and I think most of you in the audience know about these, but they, they plot essentially the lowest to the highest percentile of, um, of households uh, over the period I've done the first 15 years of democracy, so 95 more or less to 2010, and it asks the question, what has been the growth rate across these percentiles? It's a very strong visual because it suggests very clearly an unequal growth path. So what you've seen is growth gains for those at the top end of the distribution, um, and the state has then used the growth gains in the form of a revenue pool to finance social security at the bottom end. Um, and essentially that's the growth story for South Africa, an anti-poor anti or lack of pro-poor growth, right? Gains to the top end in terms of organic growth, filtering to the bottom through social assistance, but very little going on in the middle of the distribution. So our missing middle story in South Africa is really about, about this story. I want to concentrate on this and ask the question, where is the labor market in this story? And that's really the theme uh, or the sub-theme in the talk is what's happening to the labor market. If you look at the bottom end and I remove from the graphic, um, which is our income and expenditure survey, I may have switched the uh, variables. Uh, if I remove social assistance from the graphic, that's what happens. So this essentially is about regular income, right, from economic activity. You know, uh, and essentially you've got a labor market that doesn't operate and doesn't function at the bottom end of the distribution. And that's a very, very unusual um, story for, for a developing country and for middle income countries such as South Africa. Because in most other uh, economies, um, if you remove social assistance, you don't see this type of collapse uh, and something I'll argue later about uh, in terms of why that happens in South Africa. Uh, this is just another pretty picture, the Gini coefficient, right? So the story you don't really see from the growth incidence curve from the previous two slides is what happens to the Gini. This is literally the Gini coefficient across the two years. So that's 1995 and 2005. But as soon as you remove the Gini coefficient, uh, they remove social assistance, the Gini coefficient uh, increases sharply. So essentially what the uh, social assistance, which is our old age pension system, child support grants, something uh, Franz, who's in the audience, is going to talk about tomorrow, um, what it's done is to suppress income inequality. So essentially you've got a growth dynamic that is no evidence of proper growth, rising income inequality, something I didn't show, but it's risen in the 15 years since apartheid has ended. Uh, and effectively, you've got a growth policy debate which says that you've got this implicit contract 
that's broken down because the informal sector is nowhere to be seen, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, neither the non-unionized uh, and, and, and neither essentially our minimum wage is excluded from a growth process that is, that is essentially skills biased in nature. Why are we such an outlier? Well, here's the first statistic. I just picked a few from the uh, uh, from World Bank uh, data. Uh, I picked essentially upper middle income countries. I unfortunately don't have Vietnam here, but I do have it in the remaining slides. So uh, uh, apologies for that. But essentially, there's South Africa. So we've got an ILO defined unemployment rate in excess, depending on the, the quarter of 25%, but a complete outlier. In, um, in the upper middle income countries set and even in, if, if you widen the set to include uh, lower middle income countries. I want to argue that in most economies, upper middle income countries, the, the following two slides, the share of self-employed and the share of agriculture in total employment closes the labor market that in most upper middle income countries is unable to create a sufficient number of formal sector wage jobs. So in most developing countries, if you like, unemployment rates are suppressed, arguably, right, through large numbers of people in self-employment or uh, various forms of segmented informal sector employment and a fairly dynamic uh, high employment agricultural sector. In South Africa, you don't see that. So this is literally the share of um, uh, self-employed in total employment in-country estimates, um, and there's Vietnam. You can see there's a nice comparison. Over 60% of workers in the Vietnamese labor market are in self-employment. In South Africa, it hovers between 12 and 15%. And again, an outlier there. Uh, I'd welcome some views on Russia, but uh, that, that is an uh, odd result in the middle-income country set. If you look at agricultural employment, so if there's no urban informal sector employment because of a low formal sector uh, jobs, a low number of formal sector jobs, often the agricultural sector provides, yes, low quality jobs, but jobs are being provided. It's not the case in South Africa. And if you look at Vietnam, that's, an, again, another interesting comparison. We do, though, have, uh, in terms of employment, some industry uh, uh, employment that uh, um, is comparable to other middle-income countries. This is a quick overview of all the numbers that you've seen before, but just uh, a few additional ones is our very high unemployment rates. Unsurprisingly, and I can explain that later, we don't have time, a very low labor force participation rate, very low employment in agriculture, some indus in industry employment, but a fairly large public sector uh, uh, labor market. So not only are we unable to create a sufficient number of formal sector jobs, but it seems that most of these formal sector jobs are actually being created in the, um, in the public sector, and I'll come back to that. So I want to talk about why we have such a poor labor market performance in South Africa, and this is a, a, a completely truncated discussion focusing on my pet subjects namely the labor reform issues, but I'll talk a little bit about what I think is driving this poor labor market performance, namely a growth path dependency. And I should stress and emphasize that the whole series of other factors that are important. Here's a window into this growth path dependency. This is that uh, towards, as just on the cusp of um, uh, apartheid ending, which is 1993, the share of GDP by sector, and then I go to 2012 and look at the numbers. What happens in most developing countries that are creating jobs and growing, which South Africa did over this period, is that the share of uh, GDP accounted for by manufacturing, in fact, grows. In South Africa, it stays constant and, uh, depending on, on the period, actually declines. In this case, it's declined from 19 to 17%. In contrast, the share of GDP uh, accounted for by financial and business services actually increases dramatically. And that's another way of saying that you've got a growth trajectory based essentially on um, creating jobs in financial and business services and an undynamic, fairly capital intensive, large scale manufacturing industry that's not creating a sufficient number of jobs. In addition, and I'll show that later, the mining industry has contracted and agriculture has done nothing. And so we're on this growth trajectory that some would argue is capital intensive, 
is based on an uncompetitive and undynamic manufacturing sector that's never going to reduce, uh, sufficiently reduce the, um, the, the double-digit unemployment rates that we see. Another way to think about it is that if you do have a sectoral strategy or a growth path that is labor intensive, if you imagine a, a 45 degree line here and we've got gross value added and employment here, a labor intensive growth strategy would be one that's somewhere located over there, above the 45 degree line where the proportion of GDP or value added growth is exceeded by the growth in employment. You don't see that in any sector in South Africa and that's the growth trajectory. That's the growth trajectory we've been on since 1993, and certainly even for this period, 2001 to 2012. I'll come back to what's happened in agriculture um, under the labor reforms issue. So the employment story of that GDP version is that you, you, we've destroyed jobs in agriculture and mining. Um, um, mining's been because of the nature of our mining, capital intensive mining, but arguably also because of strong trade unions. And most of the jobs have been created in the public sector, accounting for 42%, right? These are sort of relative employment shifts relative to the aggregate shift um, and in financial and business services. It turns out that, and it's not shown here, that within financial and business services, it's the work we did for Martin for the WDR, a lot of those jobs are temporary employment service provider jobs. So in fact, a lot of those jobs are employers trying to get around and circumvent the labor regulatory regime. Right, and I'll be interested in the audience from the different countries whether this sector is actually growing in the developing country context. I think it is, which is this notion of trying to avoid the regulatory net. But what we've also done within that structure of growth, uh, these are simple, as I warned you, these are all sort of, I think, five or six different published papers drawing in different tables. These are based on these Katz and Murphy decompositions, which look at between and within sector shifts and ask the question, to what extent did technology influence changes in labor demand patterns? We essentially find that technology has changed our, our labor demand uh, preferences and our relative labor demand shifts. And essentially what this points to, though, is an increased um, preference uh, over the time period here for highly skilled workers. So amidst this uh, lack, of lack of dynamism in the manufacturing sector, the growth that's happened is not only capital intensive in nature, but also skills intensive. And that for me is probably the growth trajectory um, that we uh, is conceivably going to be on for the next 10 years, and it's the growth trajectory that's not going to create the kind of jobs we want. So because of time, I'll skip the, just saying what I've just told you again, that's in the slide. Um, let me turn quickly to the labor reform story and pick on two big, big issues um, around labor reform. Uh, First is to look at, you know, we, we use, again, the doing, the doing Business Survey of the World Bank, and you find that if you, if you take your EPLs, your Employment Protection Legislation, and, you, and you, uh, you find the measure for your particular country, and you look at a global distribution, and I've got the upper middle income country distribution, South Africa's labor regulatory regime for an unemployment rate of 25% is not particularly high. Um, Gary and I had this discussion earlier. So at the 62nd percentile, or they're about 65th, I think it is, for a 25% unemployment rate, I'd expect us to be much higher. So there's either something wrong in our interpretation of the ranking, or um, labor legislation doesn't matter. I think it's the limitations of the Doing Business Survey rankings, um, but, but I'm happy to talk about that further. So legislation and labor reform and the labor regulatory net does have bite. This is work based on work that Ravi and myself and Ben Stanix have done. Um, and I've just literally taken out the difference in difference estimator, which asks the question, this is the really important guy here, right? Ask the question, what has been the impact of the minimum wage, right, relative to some control group um, in agriculture, right? So there we go. It's in agriculture, and it's negative and significant, and our results, based on even the descriptive numbers, show that the minimum wage in agriculture had a negative and significant impact on employment in that sector. And that's that little bubble you saw right at the bottom end. Despite a growing um, uh, value added in, G in GDP or in growth in agriculture, you saw contraction in employment. And so we've thrown everything at this model, uh, uh, whether it's exports, whether it's the exchange rate, GDP, 
all sorts of things, and this result is robust. So there you have a very particular labor reform uh, intervention that has a negative impact on, on, on jobs. All right, so the massive job losses we saw right at the beginning in that slide in agriculture was as a consequence of, uh, of, of labor reform. It's not that simple, though, because when we do the same thing, difference and difference, same technique, uh, same estimation, uh, same data, as it turns out, for all the other minimum wages that we've had. South Africa is a sectoral minimum wage system. It turns out that the, um, the employment effects are fairly benign. In fact, they're insignificant. Right? So at the extensive margin, there's some action on the intensive margin where hours of work in one or two sectors, like taxi industry and so on, are actually adjusted. But in most cases, there isn't a significant disemployment effect from minimum wage laws. And so that then begs the question also about how one thinks about minimum wages in what is a contested terrain often between interest groups, uh, unions on the one hand and, and employers on the other hand. All right? uh, so just incidentally, um, whenever I speak to government, luckily I think my national treasury friend is not here, Fundi, they hate this result and they love this result. And it's interesting always to see the, but they always say, no, this is great. And then when you show them the agriculture one, they say, yeah, but what about this? And didn't you think about that? And so it's very interesting uh, to see people's results, uh, people's uh, reactions. One of the things we often talk about is trade unions and institutions and how they matter. So I'm moving on to the sort of second labor reform story here. And it turns out that, again, in the South African context, uh, we've written a separate paper um, uh, for Justin's uh, handbook. Uh, uh, th these are estimates of wage premium using earnings functions, right? And I'm taking Freeman's estimates from his study uh, of different developing countries, and I've inserted ours. And South Africa's, that wage premium coefficient is not that high. So the pure sort of narrow wage gains offered by the trade union movement isn't, that, isn't, isn't particularly high. Neither are wage dens uh, union density levels, right? Neither, as it, is, as it turns out, are sort of strike intensity levels. But what does matter is our inefficient and ineffective dispute resolution system. So I'm going through this fairly quickly. What I'm getting at is the notion that trade unions don't seem to matter at least in a narrow earnings function estimate. They may matter in a political economy sense, but that's a different debate. Um, but what does seem to matter in the labor regulatory regime is what happens in terms of dispute resolution. And this is an estimate based on what happens, right, in terms of the dependent variable being the number of employed by province or district over time. And what happens if you try and resolve, some of you in Accra would have seen this already, what happens if you try and resolve these disputes, right, uh, through various means, whether it's arbitration, conciliation, and, 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 and other means, right? What we essentially find, and the, the specification three is the important one, right, is that institutional inefficiency pertains. So resolution of disputes is negatively associated with employment shifts. And what it, what it points to and alludes to is the fact that it's not so much trade union power or labor legislation, but rather inefficiency in the courts of law, whether it's the labor courts, the dispute resolution systems of a country, that seems to be, at least in the South African context, the binding uh, constraint in terms of employment generation, both in time T, but also T plus one, as employers look to want to hire workers um, in future periods, seem to be uh, constrained primarily by labor market institutions. So, what, where do we come up with in terms of our labor reform story? For me, the political power of trade unions in the South African context, uh, context ma matters more than the pure wage premium effects. Dispute resolution bodies uh, seem to be the institutional binding constraint rather than anything else. Um, uh, I've argued about the strike impact. I think it's overstated based on the proportion of uh, workers on strike, based on strike intensity, length of strike, and so on, if we look at international numbers. But certainly, uh, uh, mining, I think, is a, is a special category. And we can, we can debate that. I'm happy to do that. So in conclusion, um, it is about reform. This is a smorgasbord of policy reform packages that you can think about in a high unemployment, middle-income country setting um, that, that, if you like, doesn't have, that, that perhaps is highly concentrated. 
There's stuff, I think, which is really, really important about growing the informal sector. I think we don't emphasize enough the role played by public sector procurement in, in microenterprise growth. Um, I also think there's, there's a lot to be done about risk mitigation for the informal sector. Um, there are also, I'm almost done last slide, there are also uh, uh, issues around reducing the cost of search for the, for, for the unemployed. And I think public and private employment services in developing countries don't work efficiently enough and effectively together. Um, and then a whole bunch of things about transport vouchers and so on. I'll end off by these three labor reform packages which I think are worth looking at in, uh, in, a, in, in at least in a developing country sense. And with the notion that, at least in my conversations with Gary, realizing that the search for common themes is a starting point in terms of how labor reform uh, can assist in creating employment or preventing employment losses, but certainly I think country-specific factors are really crucial in trying to understand the dynamics of employment generation and preventing job losses. Thanks. <laughs>